Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Archaeological Conservancy uh, virtual lectures. My name is Susan Bowden, and I'm the Digital Outreach Coordinator for the Conservancy. And we're very glad that you joined us tonight. A couple of reminders before we get started. Please use the Q&A section for questions so that we don't lose your questions in um, the chat stream. There will be some time toward the end where you can ask our regional directors some questions. We are live on our Facebook feed, so if you end up with any technical difficulties, you can go over to our Facebook uh, page and follow us there. And I am recording tonight, and the recording will be posted probably by midday tomorrow. So if you wanted to share it or rewatch it, you're welcome to do so. I am very, very pleased to uh, share with you that tonight you are going to get to hear from our regional directors. Um, these, uh, the Conservancy's regional, regional directors oversee almost 600 archaeological preserves across the country. They're divided into five different regions. I am incredibly fortunate to work with this wonderful group of professionals, and so I'd like to introduce them to you. Heading up the western region is Corey Wilkins. In the Midwest is Phil, Phil Milhouse. We are hoping that we can get Phil in. He's having some technical issues tonight, so um, hold on to that one. The East is handled by Kelly Berliner, and overseeing the Southeast is Jessica Crawford. And then finally, back around the corner, um, the Southwest region is April Brown. Each of our regional directors, directors will have probably 10 or 12 minutes to share what's currently happening in their regions. And they have some really very interesting and exciting projects and uh, things that they wanna share with you tonight. So with no further ado, I would like to hand it over to April. She's gonna start us off with what's going on in the Southwest region. April, it is all yours. Oh, great, thank you, Suzanne. So let me get my presentation going here. Okay, well, thank you guys for coming tonight. And I'm just gonna share just some brief updates about um, an acquisition project, our latest acquisition project in the Southwest and, and Texas, um, as well as a of uh, maintenance challenges, management challenges that we're facing here in the South. So first up, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about our latest preserve in Texas and the fair. Um, it's Camp Wood Preserve. And it's located, like I said, in the Hill Country in uh, South Central Texas, just about, about um, maybe about an hour west of San Antonio, Texas here. And so just to give you a brief background, this site was brought to our attention by Dr. Tamara Walter of Texas Tech University. And this is an aerial view of the site. And let me get my laser pointer going here so that I can, here we go. So um, Dr. Walter was actually working on this site here, which is the Mission San Lorenzo de la Cruz complex. And the property we purchased recently is in this area, it includes the house and this entire back lot. Um, and Dr. Walter specializes in mission, uh, mission archeology. span and she knew a lot about this site and she had tried to actually do some shovel testing on the other site, but the homeowner at the time wasn't interested in letting archeologists on their land, which is good for us. Um, Tamara's biggest concern and the reason that she brought it to us was because it was very much at risk of uh, being part of a pay to dig program. There's lots of pay to dig programs in this area. And essentially what they do is they use mechanical equipment to scrape off the top layers to get down to the pale paleo and um, archaic deposits, basically disregarding all the historical um, the historical layers there. And um, she was very concerned that this property would become victim to it if it became, you know, it's got sold to another landowner. Um, so she contacted us to help uh, preserve this site. And it's because of Dr. Walter that we know what uh, what kind of archaeology is actually on this site. And there's four different cultural periods that she found while excavating at the mission site. That was the Paleo-Indian period and the Archaic periods um, that are of great interest to the pay-to-dig programs. And then there is the Mission San Lorenzo complex that dated from 1762 to 1771. And then there's another historical 
a component where a military installation of Camp Wood was located here in 1857 to 70, 1873. And so Mission San Lorenzo de la Cruz was relatively, it was a relatively short-lived Franciscan mission established in 1762 um, by a Spanish soldier named Felipe Rebago. And his purpose, the purpose of this mission was essentially to Christianize um, the, the Pon Apaches who were raiding the area and to, to essentially uh, quell the raids and also to maintain territorial control over the French in, in this territory. And the mission operated for only nine years, but during that time, friars and indigenous leader, uh, laborers erected a large wilderness outpost of more than 14 adobe and limestone buildings situated around a central plaza. And you're seeing um, uh, basically a, 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 a drawing of that site. And the complex included a church, a granary, a bastion, a series of irrigation ditches and housing for the Apache. Although uh, Dr. Walter indicates that probably if the Apache camped pretty much like west of um, the mission site, which is the part that we that's on our, our current property. And so, as you can see here, there was two gates, thought to be two gates. There's one in the north, one in the south, and the southern gate opens up also to the property that we just acquired. And so, as I said, uh, Dr. Walter, she, Excavate, excavated here in 2019. And this is another aerial view of that site. And you'll notice the north and south middens here. And those middens actually extend over to the west onto our, our newly acquired property here. And here's a view of that property. And you'll see that right here is that fence line on the western boundary of the mission complex. And then you have Mission era mid in site uh, middens here in the north. And here's another view. And you can see the house here in the shed that we saw in the aerial view um, and the fence. And there's middens all throughout this area as well. And there's plenty of surface artifacts to see that include pottery, um, different stone tools, and so on and so forth. And recently, Dr. Walter did a shovel test for us. Because um, we are, have subdivided this property to sell the home and keep the vacant areas that contain the most archaeology. And she found numerous artifacts in those middens, and including pottery, uh, gun flints, metal objects, buttons, um, all kinds of interesting things. So we know there's a lot still to learn uh, on these sites that have not been disturbed. Um, so we're really happy that we were able to preserve it. And so here we're back to this view here, and you'll see the arrow here is that area we were just looking at on that on that back gate. And just to give you an orientation, this is the south part of the site, and this is the west, and this is the Nueces River here. And so we have big plans for this site, actually. Um, we're currently, like I said, working on sub uh, selling this home. It's on the market. Um, we have subdivided it in kind of a funny place here right at this tree because there is some, uh, there are some artifacts right behind the shed that we're very interested in, including a potential uh, cornerstone of the mission itself. Um, and we also have plans to start revegetating and cleaning up this area and adding some trails because ultimately we would like to remove this fence and make this property part of the larger mission property um, and we'll be working with the Nueces Canyon Mission Organization uh, to make this all happen. In fact, they're working on some grants to help us get some seeds for the revegetation project. And they're also probably going to be a big factor in helping us build those trails. And the, the goal is to eventually open up for public access, probably day use only, but uh, along with some educational kiosks that tell people what kind of archaeology there and share the history of the area. So stay tuned. We'll be sharing more about that in the future. So next, I'm going to talk about some challenges that we face here in the Southwest. And, you know, maintenance for our properties can include repairing fences, erosion control, trimming vegetation, just to name a few. But by far the biggest challenge that we face um, is disrespectful visitors, actually. And this is most often happening in the more heavily populated property residential areas where we have sites um, where people view these places as open space. 
Um, and so this is a Royal Hondo Preserve in Santa Fe. And it's surrounded, you can kind of see a house back here, but the entire property is surrounded by residential area, by numerous houses. And the residents here do view this space as trails, uh, as sort of a, a neighborhood trail. And you can see a, a prominent trail going through the site. And, you know, that would be great. Um, but and so we're finding some problems recently. And I know that a lot of people see these in national parks and in all kinds of public places. We call these museum rocks or collector's piles. Um, and to create these displays, they have to disturb and move cultural objects from their original locations. And that includes sometimes removing um, stones that were once part of the room blocks just to create the museum rock. Um, so recently we've taken the approach to dismantling these rocks, uh, basically scattering the, the pottery, um, taking the, the large stone that they used and depot, putting it somewhere far away. Um, and what you're seeing here is actually a picture we took just two days ago. Um, and this has occurred in just about a month's time because we dismantled all of the rocks just about a month ago. So these reappeared in just a matter of a few weeks. Here's another one we took from the other day. Um, we dismantled about six that day. And so basically our approach right now is to work with the homeowners association who has agreed to publish something in their newsletter about uh, not disturbing this site and to visit the site with respect. And so the future plan is to send this and to educate the public and basically get them out there for a tour and talk more about why this is why this is wrong and and how they can better help us preserve the site. But it is sort of something we're going to have to keep monitoring. And until we have the opportunity to talk to the neighbors, we'll just keep dismantling these rocks. So um, we'll be keeping an eye on that. And so we're having similar issues with disrespectful visitors at the Anthem Preserve in Phoenix, Arizona as well. And so this preserve contains a Hohokam agricultural complex that includes check dams and reservoirs, agricultural fields. Um, and this area too is also surrounded by houses. You can kind of see one peeking over the edge here, but the houses surround this entire property. And again, the, the residents view this area as open space um, and we can see regular use. And it would be fine again, except for we're finding graffiti and garbage dumping where people are, you know, it could be kids, could be, um, you know, it could be homeless people that are building some encampments, but we also have illegal camping on the property that we found recently. Um, you know, in many of these activities, they disturb the boulders that are part of some of these, uh, these um, archeological features. So it's, it's, it's a shame. So, um, ATV tracks, we have dirt bike trails. Um, in fact, we were there, we heard an ATV uh, pull up and we were trying to catch on, but they they took off before we could talk to them. Um, so we visited this site with one of the uh, with one of the employees at the Anthem Homeowner, the, the Home Association. And we're gonna work very closely with him and the neighborhood to organize a community cleanup day here in the fall. So basically what we're gonna do is get the community out there to help us pick up the garbage, clean up the site and exchange for an educational tour and lunch. So um, we're also hoping that maybe we can install some educational kiosks here in the key access points from the neighborhood that describe what the archeology span is here and remind people to visit with respect and, and to not disturb any of these features. So again, we'll be monitoring this situation very closely, but um, I, I, I mentioned, in these products because there are good reminders to everybody on how to to act and behave when you visit these archaeological preserves it's so important um to not disturb pick up things move things around um you know it's fine to visit we want people to learn from them but um we really hope that we can work with the communities to make this all better so um that's all i have tonight i i think i'll pass it over to kelly All right, great. Thank you, April. Let's see if I can get my screen shared here. Okay. All right. Hopefully everybody can see that okay. 
Uh, thank you all so much for joining us this evening. As April was pointing out, it's a really great opportunity for us to share a little bit more of the day-to-day -day what we're doing. You know, we're always trying to acquire new properties, but the reality is we have to spend a lot of time maintaining the ones that we already have. And so I'm going to do something very similar and touch on three ongoing projects we have here in the Eastern region. Uh, so again, my name is Kelly Berliner. The Eastern region covers Maine down through North Carolina. And so I'm going to start with the Arbuckles Fort Preserve. Uh, this is an 18th century frontier fort down in southeastern West Virginia, uh, outside of Lewisburg, if you know the area. And I'm really excited about this project because we acquired this several years ago in partnership with the West Virginia Land Trust. And it's been a multi-year effort to try to make this one of our preserves that can be open to the public. So. Before we get to that, briefly, as I said, it's an 18th century frontier fort. We're looking at uh, frontier settlement by Euro colonial peoples, and we're looking at conflicts like the French and Indian War and Lord Dunmore's War. So what we know about this fort comes from a lot of archeology span that was done in the 90s by Drs. Kim Arbogast McBride and Stephen McBride, who have been tremendous when it comes to researching and excavating these frontier forts, as we call them. So we know that's the heaviest occupation of this property, though there are earlier um, periods of time, such as the archaic period, where we see uh, Native American, American Indian occupation on the site as well. Uh, so again, chain of frontier forts. This particular one was built under the direction of Captain Matthew Arbuckle. And these were forts that were not only parts of these larger conflicts, like the French and Indian War, uh, like Dunmore's War, to wrestle for control of this area. But we have to keep in mind that this area was, of course, first settled by American Indians. They were living in these areas. They were areas, and they can. So, as settlement from the coast um, by Europeans and um, Eurocolonial forces spread westward, there was a lot of conflict, which prompted these forts to be built as a means of defense. Now, not only were they used for defense, but they probably served as community gathering places. You would have farmsteads, homesteads spread across what was considered the frontier, and this was a place for people to come together. Now, you can see a very good outline of the fort here, actually. This is after excavation of the stockade line. You can see it's a pretty small fort. Um, the two bastions on either end here, uh, you can likely see those little um, round areas. I don't believe I have my laser pointer on here, but on the left and right side, those are the bastions of the fort. Uh, and a bit of excavation took place on the inside as well. And the artifacts that came out of this site are what you would likely expect from a fort frontier settlement. We have gun flints, we have things like this Liberty Seal in the lower right that was maybe associated with the reoccupation during the American Revolution. We have various accoutrements, buckles, uh, buttons, scissors, cast iron fragments, things associated with a group of people who would have been living and eating in this fort. So of course we have food remains as well. But importantly, I like to point out interesting artifacts like this amulet or inscribed metal disc. So this item along with uh, several other metal objects was found in the blacksmith area of the fort. And caches of artifacts like this have been found on sites associated with African American populations. And we know from historical documentation that Matthew Arbuckle owned enslaved Africans. And so this might be an indicator that not only are they living within the fort, but they're actually holding high status occupations like blacksmith, which was really important on the frontier. So really fascinating ways to use archaeology to tease apart what's really going on at these sites. Uh, on the property, there was also a mill, a uh, Blaker's Mill. Unfortunately for us, it's been moved to a new property. Uh, it was in such good shape that the state decided to dismantle it and relocate it to Jackson Mill State Park, which is not too far away, but we still have the archaeological remnants of this mill. And this gives you a bit of the lay of the land. So uh, Muddy Creek and Mill Creek intersect just slightly south 
of the property here, but there's a solid um, area that people have long known about as being associated with the fort, and we wanted to make it available for people to visit. It's really beautiful. There's a lot of ecological benefit for preservation. You can see on the right, that's a monument that was erected to the fort about 100 years ago now um, by the Daughters of the American Revolution. And we've also been able to use this site for a lot of public outreach. So I'll give a plug, check out our YouTube channel. You'll see we did a virtual tour of this site. We have a lecture. And then most exciting, we are almost open to the public. So over the past several years, West Virginia Land Trust and the Archaeological Conservancy have figured out a way to lay out a trail and install some kiosks that can make this one of our preserves to showcase to the public a bit, to teach people not only about the resource, but also the importance of preservation and maintaining it. So if you're in West Virginia, Southeast, April 27th, 2024, we'll be having our official opening that weekend. So please, we would love to have you out there. Uh, Susan will put the link in the chat, I believe. So, or reach out to us, I'm happy to share details. Uh, sneak peek, we'll have some of our signage up. We worked with the Eastern Band of Shawnee on this project. So some really great information and just a beautiful area as well. Okay, Kelly, um, Kelly the link is already in chat and that takes you direct straight to the page where you can register to attend. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, so moving right along, uh, also in West Virginia, we recently acquired the site of Oak Mound. This is likely an Adena, uh, American Indian mound dating to around 100 BC or BCE, north central West Virginia. And this mound site, which you can see right in the center of your screen, there's an arrow pointing to it, is really in the middle of a developed area. It's got a church on one side, a storage facility on the other, residences. And so this site is already very well known. It's not exactly a hidden resource uh, or a hidden site by any means. And so we're thinking about now that we've acquired this late last year, how do we go about managing the fact that it is so exposed to the public, if you will? We want to make sure it's protected, but also use this as an opportunity for education. So again, it's a large mound overlooking the West Fork River. Uh, originally, it was probably about 10 to 12 feet high, about 60 feet in diameter based on the records. And it was pretty extensively excavated in the 1960s by Salem College. It was thought that this would be turned into a parking lot. And so uh, they excavated prior to that. There were burials and artifacts uncovered, and then the dirt was, was heaped back up. And then fortunately, it was, it was not turned into a parking lot. But as I said, it's very well known. There's multiple uh, signs around the area, but they're quite a bit dated. And so what we're looking at for next steps is having received the donation from the Goff family to protect it for um, the perpetuity. They've done a good job for over 50 years. We want to honor their request to put an interpretive sign on the property. And we've got great partners to do this. Uh, we're going to work with archeologist Olivia Jones, who's with the West Virginia Department of Arts, History and Culture. We've been working with West Virginia University student, Bethany Prasik. Both of them were very, very critical for learning about this site and bringing it to our attention. And beyond that, we're also now working with the Osage Nation and the Seneca Nation of Indians to develop some text and images for that panel. So when people drive out there, because this site's even listed on Google Maps, they'll actually have some context for the site as well as how to treat this really important resource respectfully, especially for those descendant communities that are connected to the site. And then last but not least, something totally different, uh, heading up to Western New York State. This is just outside of Buffalo, the Eaton Preserve. Uh, this is a site that has occupation going back to the Archaic period, so thousands of years ago, but its heaviest use was during the 16th to 17th century. So these were Iroquoian peoples, not necessarily the Haudenosaunee or Six Nations Iroquois, as you might be thinking of, but people that spoke a similar language. It might have been groups that are known historically as the Erie um, or the Neutral. We're not totally sure. Um, 
But again, major occupation around AD 1550. A lot of the work on this site was done by archaeologist William Engelbrecht, Bill Engelbrecht, a longtime Conservancy member, and we're so grateful for it and for his help with this site. We acquired it in 2005. And it's a really beautiful piece of property. It's right on Casanova Creek. And you can see here, there's a lower area of vegetation and a higher area as well. So I'm very excited to announce that we actually received grant funding to do an initial survey for essentially vegetation management on the property. So this is from the Western New York Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management to take a look at the vegetation that is out there, figure out what is invasive, what is native, and can we do anything to eliminate the invasive species and try to maybe replant with native species that would be reflective of uh, plants that were being used by the native communities and that would have been there uh, historically. Of course, first and foremost, we want to make sure the site is not negatively impacted, but I'm really excited. We have a great team of researchers, Bill Engelbrecht, excuse me, Bill Engelbrecht has really been heading this research along with um, other colleagues in different departments to really approach this holistic look at preserving the archeological site, but seeing how we can do better in terms of species management on this parcel. So this is brand new. I'll be up there next week, uh, meeting with these folks to see what our next steps are. And so I'm really excited about that. So uh, all the way from interpretive science to vegetation management, we do a little bit of all of this for all of our properties. And uh, thank you all so much for taking the time to hear us out on it and learn a little bit more about our day to day. Uh, so thank you so much. And I think with that, am I passing to Jessica or Corey at this point? You're passing over to Jessica. Thanks so much. All right. Great. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Let me stop sharing here. Perfect. Thank you, Kelly. Let me share my screen. Um, let's see. The sharing. Oh, there. I guess everyone can see that. Okay. Um, well, like Kelly said, we are always working on acquisitions. It's not always, um, not not all site maintenance, not all research. It's seasonal work often, but always working on new acquisitions. And we're doing that in the Southeast region. Um, Nikki Matson, who's our field rep, recently visited with a landowner in Webster County, Mississippi, to do a survey for a mound site that the family is donating a protective easement on. So that's the latest thing we've kind of done out in the field. I'm planning a visit to a sandstone bowl quarry in uh, Alabama. I'm really looking forward to that. And that's sandstone, not soapstone. So this is going to be something a little bit different. We do have two soapstone quarry sites in Georgia. So I'm, I'm excited about visiting with this site and the, visiting this site and this landowner. Um, I'm also going to be looking at some new acquisitions in Arkansas and Georgia. I just got a phone call about a site in Florida just just before um, just before we went live just a little while ago. And of course, we're working on signage for a portion of the uh, donated portion of the ancient Gulf Shores Canal in Gulf Shores, Alabama. So we're working on signage for that. Um, but a lot of what we do is seasonal. In the southeast, it's warming up. It's spring. So a lot of what we're working on is site maintenance. And in the southeast, that usually means cutting grass. And it's, you know, every site is different in how we manage it. Not every site has to have grass cut. We've got sites in woods and pastures and uh, agricultural fields. But, and we do, trust me, we do try to let grass grow. We don't try to we we like to let the grass get a little bit tall for the bees and and birds and butterflies and everything else. But a lot of times we have sites that are in areas where the grass does have to be cut on a regular basis, and we don't want volunteer trees in the large sites that we own. So that's that's what Nikki and I spend a lot of our time doing. It's right now it's time for invoices for grass cutting, and these invoices come in the form of emails, snail mail text just in, at all times for sites all over the southeast so you know once we acquire a site it's that's that's not the end of the work there's a lot of work that goes into site acquisition but then there's site maintenance also because you know you can't tell people that we preserve archaeological sites and then not take care of them um, another example of some of our site 
maintenance issues, especially lately this spring, um, has been have been some encroach, encroachment issues on a mound site in Louisiana, and this came up just this week. This mound site has been sort of a, a thorn in our side. Sometimes it's hard to protect a site that's in a neighborhood. It's harder to protect a site in a neighborhood than it is one that's out by itself where you worry about looters or trespassers. Um, We've tried to work with landowners adjacent to us to educate them about the importance of this mound site. For a long time, it's been used as a ramp for four wheelers. We've put up signs and quite often in this case, they've been ignored. And some of our neighboring landowners sort of forget about these property lines. And we just found out recently, one of them did put up a dog pen on our part of the property. You can see I've got a mount, a, an arrow there that shows the toe of the mound. In fact, there is um, this dog pen and, and someone has moved a trailer onto our property. And and we are we're trying to to put up some educational signage. But, you know, you can have educational signage. But when people aren't clear about where the property lines are, you know, we're just going to have to, I think, put up a fence. But still, it's, it's difficult. And this is something that's probably going to have to be done. A lot of work is going to have to be done in person. They're um, just going to get there and knocking on doors and asking people to move the dog pen, which is you know, not not always a fun thing to do. But we do have allies in this neighborhood, so we're we're counting on them a lot, also. And another thing, I, another issue I recently became aware of was some hog damage at the Lions Bluff site in Mississippi. Um, you know, at, we have, like April talked about inconsiderate visitors. Well. In this case, my inconsiderate visitors have snouts and they're rooting around all over the Lions Bluff site. And this is actually, unfortunately, not uncommon in the Southeast. And this is a special problem. I mean, landowners all over the Southeast have to deal with the damage done by wild hogs. But this was really startling when I visited uh, Lions Bluff a couple of weeks ago with an archae a local archaeologist. And we just saw the ground literally chewed up by wild hogs. And so we're going to have to get creative and form some partnerships with um, some wildlife agencies to to help us kind of bring these things, these wild hogs under control. And it's, again, it's, you can just Google wild hog damage and you'll see that everybody in the Southeast and maybe other parts of the country is, is trying to figure out the secret of how do you, how do you control wild hogs? They're not native and they reproduce several times a year and they have no natural predators. And they're doing a tremendous amount of damage to archaeological sites in, in the southeast region. So I was really bummed to go out there and see what's happening here. Uh, we also have research that is occurring currently on one of our preserves, uh, Carson Mounds. We have ongoing research there. A dissertation student from Illinois is doing her dissertation work there. Uh, the Carson Mound site in Mississippi, it's, it's a multi-component site, but one of the most interesting components is the fact that it, it's a Cahokia outlier site. So we um, we have an, a researcher who's been working there for a couple of months and she's still there now. And we go out there and, and check on her and, and, and try to help her out periodically. We're also preparing for a field school at uh, Prospect Hill Plantation, also in Mississippi. Uh, this will be done by Dr. Sean Lambert with Mississippi State University, and he's also working with a cultural anthropologist with Troy State University. And this is a fascinating collaborative effort, and we're collaborating with uh, researchers in Liberia, Africa. Um, this is a, a site that involves the um, sort of the reverse African diaspora, the, the enslaved people at Prospect Hill. A large group of them were were freed and returned and made the trip to Africa to settle in a colony established by the Mississippi Colonization Society in the 1840s. And so we're going to do collaborative and comparative research till in late July. And this is also a public outreach pro uh, project. So the public will be invited to come and, and visit and, and help Dr. Lambert do excavations on the enslaved areas behind that big house at Prospect Hill. So we're, we're really excited about that. In fact, he gave a presentation on that yesterday. And I think we'll get, I'll get Susan to, to share a link to that uh, presentation in the, the chat. I'm working on it right now for you. Okay, great. And another thing that I've been spending a lot of time on is a new acquisition. It's called Spokane Mound in South Mississippi, near Natchez, Mississippi. Uh, we had to buy a lot more property than we needed there. This is a, a mound site. Um, so as far as we know, there's just one low mound there. 
There's also an archaic component. The mound we believe is probably late woodland. So it, it is a multi-component site. It has not been researched extensively and you know, there are no plans for research there, but we did, in order to preserve the site, we had to buy some extra land. We had to buy more than we needed, which is not uncommon. So we had some wonderful volunteers, local volunteers come and help us. We had, we decided to fence off the portion that has the archaeology on it, the archaic site and the mound, so that it would be in its own fenced section. And so we had some volunteers come come out with us a couple of weeks ago to uh, to put up a fence. And this is, and it's a huge, huge help when people offer their their time and their expertise to do these things for us. That way, you know, I didn't have to hire someone. It was just myself and two other volunteers. And we went out there and put up this fence. And yes, you can see, um, we use my brush guard on my, <laughs> my forerunner to actually pull the fence tight. <laughs> but it, it turned out beautifully. And while we were out there working, the former landowner and his dog came out and visited us, um, you know, we were really fortunate that that this landowner decided to allow us to preserve this site. It's it's an important site and and it's a beautiful site. Of course, it's obviously in a pasture. It's not going to be farmed. So now that we have the fence up, now again in the southeast, it's time to get the mowing started. <laughs> and you can do uh, see a, a virtual tour of the Spokane Mound site. Um, I think Susan's going to share that in the chat also, and it'll also be on our YouTube channel as well. So I just, this is sort of an example and it wasn't of what we do, you know, on a daily basis, we wear many hats and it really was not planned uh, for all of us to talk about, to talk about maintenance issues. When we got together to discuss what we're gonna talk about, it just turned out that all of us, <laughs> we were like, well, I'm doing these, I'm dealing with these maintenance issues. So, so I'm really glad that we've got, had the opportunity to share uh, what goes on at the Conservancy for Regional Directors, which is just more than just site acquisition. It's also public education and, and maintenance issues. And we couldn't do it without our members and our supporters. So I appreciate those who are interested enough to support the Conservancy and to tune in tonight. And so I will now share this, share the floor uh, or hand the floor over to Corey in the Western region. Thank you, Jessica. Let me get my presentation up here. Okay. Sorry, guys, I'm having a bit of an issue. Can I help, Corey? Um, I minimize the screen now. I can't get it back. Um, try hitting escape. Can you see my screen? We can see your screen, yeah. Okay. Go ahead and, and do the... Um, I'll just press on then. Yeah, go ahead and... Click from beginning, it should be good, good, good to go. All right, we good? Yep, that looks great, thank you. Okay, <laughs> so I wanna talk about a couple of our re more recent acquisitions. Uh, the first one is our Chinatown Garden site in McQualamy Hill, California. As you can see from the map, it's it's just southeast of Sacramento in the foothills. It's McQualamy Hill is a, is a small mining town on Highway 49. The, the site of uh, Chinatown Gardens operated between 1848 and 1898. Uh, the gardens were developed in the, the 1860s um, for agricultural purposes, uh, water chestnuts, Chinese potatoes, and, and decorative gardens. There are no other known remaining Chinatown Gardens in California. McQualamy Hill History Society, and that is History Society, purchased the four acre site at auction in 2015 and 2018, a couple of different parcels. Um, they offered it to us in 2022. What they wanted to do was recover their, the cost of, of their property, uh, have us take over management, and so they could focus more on, on other aspects of, of their operation. 
and the property was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in January of 2023. And that nomination was done by archaeologist Julia Costello, who has worked extensively at the site. So this is the footprint of, of the original Chinatown in McQualamie Hill. Um, where you see my cursor is where the gardens were on this side of this road. Um, the Conservancy also purchased this this lot right here, which has a foundation and some subsurface um, value to it. But the, the gardens are here. You can see the terrace walls in this map. This is a good map of, of the actual gardens now. There was an old Buddhist temple down here at the bottom, in the south end, a uh, platform for, for uh, vegetable sales, things like that. Big pond right here in the middle, water chestnuts. And then these these terraces were were separated by these stone walls. This is the old Buddhist temple that you saw on the south side. You have the picture of it as it was as it was falling down. This on the uh, on the right hand side, this picture, this platform is where the temple once stood, and the the road was also built over the top of, of part of that platform. Down in here is where the pond would have been, and then further down the hill the terraces and, and more of the gardens. This picture on the left-hand side is of a similar um, a similar garden China, slash China, Chinatown in Oregon around 1892. This is what McQualamie Hill uh, Chinatown and, and gardens would have looked like, very similar. Again, no, no known gardens. Um, this is on the right-hand side, a picture of one of the, the terrace walls, then these would have been farmed above and below. This is the gulch where you can see it, the wall here. There's another one up here. And the, the Buddhist temple would have been up here about where that car is right about there. Um, there were several springs in this area that fed these gardens. And that's why it was it was optimal for, for uh, agriculture. This is a, a mosaic that was, it's on the wall. There's a, there's right next to the, the Chinatown, there's a park and this is on the, on a wall to a, a building, um, retail building. And all of these things, all these artifacts came out of, out of the site. And they built this mosaic of the garden and the buildings and then, and then some other um, artistic things. Um, during surface collection, when Julia, again, Julia Costello, when she was studying the site, uh, one surface collection exposed an artifact deposit um, that yielded remains of 30 large Chinese brown glazed stoneware uh, jars, eight medium Chinese jars, five Chinese porcelain bowls, five Euro, uh, Euro American bowls and plates, um, and 10 aqua bottles. <clears throat> and the subsurface artifacts remain. So that was one of our more, our more recent in California. And the, the contrast between that site and, and this site that I'm gonna talk about is so much is known about Chinatown Gardens, the history, the people, uh, everything is very well documented. This site here in Nevada was one we were, we were brought to um, from the owner and they were doing a parcel split and the owner didn't know what she had, so she came to us. And it's in, it's just outside of Reno, right on Lake Lahontan. It's a, a traditional Paiute, Paiute territory. Um, the contrast again, the culture of the site is completely unknown and the age of the site is completely unknown. So this is Lake Lahontan here. Our site sits in this general area on one of the hills. The site faces predominantly south This here is an is an overview, and it's it's hard to see, but if you can if you can make out these green circles on this side of the hill, they go around. This is the top of the hill. Um, these green circles. There's 76 of them that we counted, and this is what they look like. We originally went out uh, for our for our initial visit with the landowner. Um, Walked into this, I, I had an archaeologist, Dr. Greg White, in Cal, out of California, out of Chico. Um, he went with me, 
we walked into the site and had no idea what we had. Um, so we documented all of the all of the the stone circles. Um, looked for other artifacts. There were no associated artifacts. Um, so I took it to the board, and they weren't sure what we had. So they sent me back. So I did another site visit, and again, we we were we were left with nothing but questions. So after a lot of discussion, several board meetings, we decided that indeed there was a lot of a lot of research potential here. Um, and since then, the leading the leading theory on these is that they are ceremonial. Um, kind of a, maybe a vision quest site, but we're still uncertain. We're hoping to get um, a student from from University of Nevada here in Reno out there to, to maybe take a look and do some research. Again, these 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 circles are massive. They average in size um, between two and fifteen rock tiers high. Uh, they're about between a half a meter and almost two meters deep and about mm, two, three meters wide. They're just massive. The amount of the amount of effort it would have taken to move all of these rocks when you see it in person is is just astonishing. So lastly, I'm going to talk a little bit about maintenance issues myself. We the weather in in the West has been, uh, not great this winter. It's been very windy, uh, and that brings about obvious problems when you're uh, maintaining property and and ar ar uh, archaeological sites. So I got this picture from our neighbor and my site steward, and he just sent me a quick blurb and said one of the trees fell over and and uh, probably is going to need to be cleaned up. This is right in the city of Sacramento. Um, so the city is is pretty tight about how how the site looks. Um, they're they're adamant that we maintain our our uh, vacant lots. So I needed to get in there and take a look at this tree. The grass is actually taller than it than it normally is. They cut it the next day. So I saw this picture and I thought, ah, eh, little tree, we'll go take care of it. Well, not so little. Um, it's a it's a massive old walnut tree um, I was able to get somebody in there to, to cut it up once they found that it was or once they cut it up they found that it was hollow and full of termites and so they supposed that the tree on on the left hand side is in the same condition and ready to fall over so I since had to have them go in and cut that down and take care of that as well another issue when trees fall over and this one isn't as bad as it could have been for sure um, these root balls pull up, they make giant holes and they pull up all, all kinds of artifacts. So that takes some, some repair and stabilization, which we will need to go in uh, in a couple of weeks and, and do that. It's been raining over there, so it's super muddy. We'll get in there when, when we can and, and clean it up, document it, and we've got somebody to take this wood. But here's the thing, one tree, surprise cost, to cut up and remove the one that fell over was $2,800. To trim and stabilize the others was 25. That's one storm cost us 500 or $5,300. Um, and we, this is just one issue. So acquiring sites and preserving them is, is, is absolutely what we do. It's, it's why we exist. But then on the backside, as you can see, we are, we are all dealing with these maintenance issues and the cost of those issues. And uh, we really appreciate your support in helping us with these efforts. Thank you. Thank you so much, regional directors. I, I'm in awe. Um, I'm gonna ask you guys to come back on screen so we can get some questions answered. But um, when I stop and think about, we just heard about less than 15 of our sites and the Conservancy has almost 600 sites. And so they're doing this kind of work for every single one of them. And that's pretty extraordinary. So hats off to all of you. Um, a couple of questions 
and, or excuse me, a couple of, of um, comments and also a question. April, um, are you ready to go with, with that question? Did you see me text it to you? Uh, sure. Did you text me something? Oh, I sent I sent it in the chat. So the question was about uh, a Texas site, the Sunset Ranch project, and they were wondering if there's any kind of an update on that particular project. So I'll give you a minute to think. Um, let me share the two comments that came through, and then you then you can respond to that one. Okay. So um, Jessica, in response to your conversation about the the wild pig issue. Gretchen says that there's a year round hunting season in California that's dealing with that same exact issue. So you're not alone. It's it's year round. There's a year round hunting season in Mississippi. And I think in the entire Southeast, it's we need more people hunting them, actually. <laughs> and we're looking at, you know, large traps, you know, traps that are timed that lure lots of hogs in and then fall down and trap several of them. But it's it's yeah, it's a crazy, difficult problem to address. And, uh, you know, yeah, it's open season. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Marilyn shared um, for all of you that Crow Canyon just today had a webinar that was about this construction heritage idea, which addresses how people tend to decorate and leave lots of traces in national parks and conservation areas. Um, and it was presented by anthropologists, Dr. Michelle Turner and Dr. Derek Turner. And um, they have that up on their website already. So all of us could go take a look at that. Participants, you also, I'll find that and send it out um, in the follow-up email that I send for you. So you have that. So yeah, with that's that, April, did you have enough think time? Yeah, actually, I can just tell you, we are planning a visit to Sunset Ranch in the very near future. I think we're going sometime in May. Um, we have some state archaeological markers that we need to install there. And um, we're going to be visiting with site stewards and people um, that want, maybe want to show us some other areas that could also be protected. Um, but it's a pretty remote place. And um, as far as I know, people are keeping their eyes on it. I mean, it's not... Uh, it's definitely being monitored at least fairly regularly, but we would definitely need to get out there and post the markers and 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 take a, a, a fresh look at the site and see what else is needed. So thank you so much. Um, I know that we have at least one site article um, on the website about Sunset Ranch. And so if you're interested in knowing about what that site is, uh, go to the website and um, look under the uh, preserves tab and you should be able to search for it there. They're wonderful petroglyphs. That's what they are. So go take yeah. a look. <laughs> yeah, it's an amazing site. Um, Randy just typed in a question. Are there volunteer opportunities available similar to the ones with the PIT program? And I'm not sure who that question goes to. Anybody know? Randy, you want to give is, me What is PIT? Uh, I know that one. That's Passport in Time. That's a Forest Service volunteer excavation project. Um, since the Conservancy doesn't actually conduct excavation on our sites ourselves, um, we don't we don't have volunteer we have volunteer opportunities for site maintenance and site stewardship, but not for excavations. But we can certainly direct you, you know, to projects that are happening on our preserves, like research projects. So, for, you know, for instance, the one at Prospect Hill in Mississippi that will take place in late July is will be open to volunteers. So we can we can direct you to research that's going on on our sites and you can contact the researchers and see if there are volunteer opportunities there. But the Conservancy itself doesn't do research, so we don't coordinate the volunteer opportunities within research. But we can certainly help you find a place to volunteer on our preserves when research is occurring. Thanks, Jessica. And if you wanted to get a hold of any of our regional directors, I'm going to refer you back to the website. There's a contact tab and their emails are directly there. Um, Jessica, you're getting a workout tonight. Could you talk about the bronze NHL plaque ceremony on Jake Town from Mark Barnes? Um, there are no plans yet to actually, with, and this is the Jake Town side in, in Mississippi, Belzona, Mississippi. It's a um, late archaic through Mississippian mound site. The Conservancy owns about 69 acres there, and it's a national historic landmark. And we recently were um, given a, a bronze plaque for the site from the Park Service. And we are, are hoping to do some type of a, a presentation ceremony. We're not going to erect, put the bronze plaque just 
because we worry about you know it being stolen or defaced at the site and it also might encourage trespassing so we will have it housed at a local museum and when that ceremony is planned we'll we'll announce it and advertise it widely um, we have a lot of a lot of people to coordinate for that ceremony we want to get with some tribes and also the local museum and the local community so um, we'll we'll make we'll make sure there's a lot of publicity when the bronze plaque is presented Thanks, Jessica. Um, now, I know at least three of you talked about uh, mounds. Somebody's got a question, or Mary has got a question about mounds. Are you able to ascertain whether they contain artifacts or remains? I have a lot of mounds in my regions, <laughs> so I, <laughs> I'll, I'll take that. Um, sometimes we know just based on previous research, uh, but again, the Conservancy is not excavating these mounds ourselves that's done by researchers who submit a research design and go through certain steps and collaboration and things like that so you know sometimes we know and sometimes we don't know and again as long as we own these sites they're protected and we may not know for a long time so it's it, it depends on the researchers and and what work has been done in the past I mean we always have access to previous research on these sites and and that can give us an idea but there's a lot unknown and that's what archeology span is. You just, sometimes you just don't know. <laughs> if, I, if I could jump in there. And it's interesting because mound can be kind of a generic term. A mound in California in the West is completely different than what you would see in the Southeast, I think, and, and other parts of the country. Um, for instance, a mound in the Sacramento Valley would be something they would have built up out of the flood zone for a habitation site. And we pretty much know what's in those mounds. Um, but you know, a completely different animal than what you would find in, in the other regions. Interesting. And everyone is unique. You know, um, each each site has its own part, own page of history to write. So you know, they're not all cookie cutter and not all the same. So um, each one is unique, and you just we can't know always. Right. All right. Any more mound information? I think we have answered all the questions that came up. Thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you, regional directors. Fantastic. Um, we will get Phil uh, to, to uh, come back at some point. He was not able to connect. Uh, the Midwest is having some technology issues, I think. So aside from that, thank you so much. Um, oh, one more dropped in. Do we mind doing one more? This one looks like it's for Corey. Um, are you are you, are you aware that the Tucson Chinese community is being researched? There may be a Chinese garden there, and a researcher's finding that most of the Chinese came from two provinces in China. Tucson, Arizona. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm not aware of that. That's in actually in April's region. So April, there may be a connection there. So right, I'm I'm not aware of it either. So yeah, oh, interesting. Send me some information. <laughs> Uh, that was from Mark Barnes. Mark, thank you. If you have any information for either one of them, please please pass it on. That would be great. Mark Mark is a great conservancy supporter, so he knows how to send us information. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. All right. I think we're going to wrap it up so that we can all uh, go on to our evening. Thanks for joining us. We are going to have another um, webinar at the end of May. We're going to bring in our um, editor of the archaeological, or excuse me, the American Archaeology Magazine, Tracy Lowe. She's going to be sharing um, some insights and, uh, and upcoming uh, tidbits from the summer edition with you. So thanks for joining us. Thank you, everybody. And we will see you later. Good night. Thank you, Susan. Good night, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, thanks Susan.